So good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, so um, my colleague Jeremy Nowak and I uh, published the new localism, How Cities Can Thrive in the Age of Populism in January of this year. And since then, we've been crisscrossing the United States and parts of Europe uh, presenting. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to see what uh, your reaction is to our thesis and our recommendations. So let's start with something that builds from the earlier panels. Everything has changed and everything is changing. Uh, the pace of technological innovation, demographic transformation, the aging of our societies, uh, economic restructuring, whether the, the older models of economic strategy yielded good jobs with quality wages, climate change. Everything has changed and everything is changing. The result in many parts of the world is the rise of what we would call angry populism. The, the challenges are very real. Uh, the growth of economic insecurity or the growth of cultural anxiety. Uh, what populism is doing for the most part is exploiting grievances, but the grievances are very real. What we're seeing is a different kind of result from the bottom up, and that's because in the world today, there is the convergence of the local and the global. Uh, to a large extent, globalization is diminishing some of the traditional roles of the nation state, and it's elevating the roles of the city state and the responsibilities of the city state. And that means for mega cities like Moscow or for many other cities in Russia, there's the ability to innovate around the central challenges of our time, uh, to learn from other cities around the world, uh, but also to have your own mark. Let's see if the next will come up. Yes. So what our book is about is a philosophy and practice of problem solving. In the 20th century, problem solving for the most part, whether it's economic, social, environmental, was top-down, driven by government for the most part, and driven by specialists, experts, compartmentalized agencies and bureaucracies. That's really how the 20th century operated. What we're basically saying is in the 21st century, networked economies, networked societies, global connectivity, problem solving increasingly will be bottom up, driven by government, yes, but also private, civic, university, community sectors, and interdisciplinary. And it's this last piece which is really critical because if you're gonna to try to solve issues like traffic congestion or environmental degradation or social mobility, just consigning solutions to one special agency will pretty much give you only one set of solutions. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you crowdsource solutions and you build from the bottom up through multiple sectors, you get a range of of responses. So we think responsibility increasingly in the world is shifting downward uh, from the nation state to the city state. It's also shifting from government alone to multiple sectors. Um, and it's moving along global circuits of idea generation, capital, and trade. Right? A, a, a relatively medium-sized city in the United States or in Russia or in other countries could be putting forth, designing, financing, and delivering solutions that within two or three or four or five years begin to uh, affect both the consciousness of leaders in other places, but also their actions. So if you're in a city world, what you want to do is you want to find models. You're not necessarily looking for rules or even programs that might have traditionally come from higher levels of government. You're looking for norms and models that then can be adapted and adopted across the world. So 
when we started this book, we were primarily looking for models around growth, governance, and finance. We could have been looking for models around social issues like homelessness, or the opioid crisis, or affordable housing, or any number of issues. But we decided, you know, given the nature of economic change, and, and again, why populism was being fueled in so many places, to look for norms of growth, governance, and finance. So let, let me tell you three stories, and then we could decide their relevance for Russia and other parts of the world. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The city is about 300,000, the county is about a million, the metropolis is about two and a half million. Uh, it is a gorgeous place that sits at the confluence of multiple rivers. This is what it looked like 40 years ago. It was the steel capital of the United States, uh, and to a large extent, the world. Um, I had a relative who lived right outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I used to go there as a young child, and it would take me about six days to, to breathe because the sky was orange from the steel mills. In, in the late 1970s, the steel mills collapsed, literally overnight, and tens of thousands of jobs were lost. And the question for Pittsburgh, like many older industrial cities, is what is our future? Um, this is a nuclear reactor in Three Mile Island in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania. To some extent, ironically, the rebirth of, of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania began because of this nuclear disaster. When this nuclear disaster occurred, uh, people were scurrying around trying to find solutions. Uh, and the solutions that were put forward were in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Ultimately, um, major companies went to this person, uh, Red Whitaker, one of the first roboticists in the world, and his group of engineers at Carnegie Mellon University, his children's crusade, and said to them, how do we understand the extent of the damage in Three Mile Island, and then how do we clean it up? And they developed the beginnings of autonomous vehicles, right? movable robots that could be sent into the basements of the nuclear reactor to assess the damage, which then gave everyone a sense of how to cure it. Um, <coughs> Red Whitaker was at Carnegie Mellon University, which is in the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you fall out of Carnegie Mellon University, you're in the University of Pittsburgh. If you fall out of the University of Pittsburgh, you're in another major health center. Everything is within a square mile. Right? That's a 19th century, early 20th century geography that has been revalued by the innovation economy because it naturally allows for researchers, faculty, students, people from mature companies, startups, scale-ups, incubators, accelerators to come together, share ideas, invent new products or processes, commercialize for the market, both solve problems and grow the economy. This is a organic innovation district. As I was saying earlier this morning, cities to some extent are competing to be first movers on next generation technologies like automation or advanced robotics or autonomous vehicles or 3D printing or genomics. Pittsburgh has a first mover advantage in all five of these next generation technologies because of its university base, but because the city and its philanthropic foundations and its corporations take risk. Back in the 1970s, they started betting on these technologies before we even had names for them. And therefore, 40 years later, they can wake up with Silicon Valley companies competing to be in Pittsburgh and startups and scale-ups obviously moving at, at a rapid pace. Pittsburgh is what we would call in the, in the US an it city, right? A lot of people, mill millennials would like to live there. But more importantly, companies have to be there. They have to be there not because anyone's throwing tax money at them, but because they have to be near the secret sauce. Talented researchers, talented workers who can base those, help those companies get a competitive edge. 
Many of you in the room have heard that Amazon is looking for a second headquarter in the United States and cities are falling over themselves to throw money at Amazon to move to their city. Uh, Pittsburgh didn't throw a dime at these companies. They came because Pittsburgh invested in the platform of advanced universities and talented workers and quality place. You put that together, the companies will come. So a city must think like a system and act like an entrepreneur. Cities are not governments, cities are networks. So you have to think across multiple disciplines and then you need to take risk. Risk may not give you returns in the near term, it may never give you returns, but ultimately if you're thinking ahead where the puck is going, so to speak, to use a hockey analogy, you can basically score big as Pittsburgh did. A few lessons. Pittsburgh has moved from being a rust belt to being a brain belt, right? It still makes things. It's still a maker city. It just makes different things in the 21st century than it made in the 20th. It's building on its legacy. You know, making things is in its bones to a large extent. And it's basically building on that as opposed to saying, we're gonna be the next whatever Silicon Valley of the world. No, they're being the next Pittsburgh. They're being the best 21st century version of themselves. And philanthropy, which in the US is hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, is investing in next generation economic growth because that's good for the city, it's good for the fiscal base, it's good for people. So there are a lot of lessons coming out of Pittsburgh. Second city and second idea, which is how do you govern a city? if a city's a network and not just a government. So we go to Indianapolis. So Indianapolis uh, in the mid 1970s was like a lot of American cities. There was nothing left in the core. It had all depopulated for the suburbs. So what people would say, uh, this was what you would do for fun on a weekend in Indianapolis in the 1970s. Um, is you'd take, I guess this is only for men, you'd take a shotgun, you'd go downtown and you'd hunt for pigeons. Um, I mean, this was a place where nothing happened. Everyone had just decamped um, for elsewhere. And there's a famous American novelist named Kurt Vonnegut. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Um, and he grew up in Indianapolis and he basically said this was a city where for 364 days you would play miniature golf, and then on the 365th day you would celebrate and go to the Indianapolis Speedway. Um, I guess they didn't have Christmas in Indianapolis, but who knows. Um, so this is what it looked like. It basically was a boring, dead downtown that rolled up its sidewalks at five o'clock in the afternoon. Nothing happened, no one lived there. The business leaders and the political leaders and the heads of philanthropies and universities came together and basically said, uh, we got to restore the core. If a city and a metropolis does not have a center, it has no soul. If there's nothing happening on the streets of your downtown, there's no reason for anyone to stay and there's no reason for anyone to come there. So they decided in the mid 1970s, uh, this is maybe sound a little strange, <coughs> to become the amateur sports capital of the universe. And they started building facilities, sports facilities, all over the downtown, very concentrated and co-located. So they just built a lot of stadiums for every amateur sports that you could possibly imagine competing for the Olympics. And then they went out and they started stealing sports teams from other parts of the United States. This is very controversial. When I'm outside of Indianapolis, people get very upset about this because a lot of these things happen in the middle of the night, literally. Sports teams were just moved from Baltimore to Indianapolis. But they became very successful at sports. And they actually built uh, uh, an entity called the Indiana Sports Corporation. And that entity um, was governed by political leaders, elected officials, mayor and so forth, <coughs> but also corporate and civic leaders. So together, they decided what to build, where to build, how to finance it, how to leverage it. <coughs> End of the 1990s. 
you know, incredible activity in, in Indianapolis. It was the amateur sports capital of the United States. Question was, you know, how much beer and hot dogs can you consume, right? I mean, building a sports economy may be fun and may attract a lot of people to come to your city, but does that really build high wage jobs and build a platform for advanced growth? So the same people who decided to become the amateur sports capital of the world to decide, decided to become the life sciences capital of the United States. And they built an entity called the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership with corporate, civic, and university CEOs, had to be the CEOs, and they backed this entity with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and they basically said, what we're going to do is we're going to bet on what already is a competitive advantage for us, life sciences, medical devices, Indiana still makes things, but we're going to get better and better and better at it. And the same way we used to steal sports teams, we're going to steal the best faculty around the world to come to Indianapolis now that there's a there there in the downtown. So these are all the initiatives of the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, which is a private, civic, networked entity that meets to decide how to invest in the future rather than just discuss and debate. It makes decisions, it makes investments. So they've raised a crazy amount of dollars from corporations and philanthropies. They've actually built a biosciences research institute without any government dollars. This is private-led, civic-led. The result is Indiana is now the second largest exporter of life science products in the United States after California because they've had 20 years of intentionality and purpose of leaders steering and stewarding their economy. Be an ecosystem rather than be an, an ecosystem. These are CEOs of major global companies, but they're sitting together, they're playing well together. This is the lesson of the sandbox when we were two or three years old, and they're making transformative decisions together. <coughs> so the lessons, the mechanics. Can you build an organization which makes decisions backed by capital in the, in the interest of your larger economy? Can you operate at the district level, the downtown level, the city level, the metropolis level, and frankly, the state level? Because Indiana has all these assets all over the state and central Indiana is now basically supporting the growth of jobs in cities hundreds of miles away. Think about that from a Moscow perspective, right? Uh, because Indianapolis is like the Moscow of Indiana. And can you organize private and civic wealth for public good? There's obviously private returns here. Companies are doing well, right? Um, their stock prices are going up, all the wonderful American metrics. But this is very good for long-term inclusive growth, for workers, for citizens, and part of their initiatives are to go early into elementary and secondary schools and to begin to give young children the skills and credentials they need. Last piece is around finance. So we had to leave the United States to do this story uh, because the U.S. obviously has no problem, like absolutely no problem, investing in companies, whether they're startups, whether they're scale-ups, whether they're publicly held companies, whether they're private companies. The U.S. has no capital problem with regard to the market. But it has a huge issue when it comes to building infrastructure, modern infrastructure, Roads, transit, broadband, energy, particularly green, clean infrastructure. So to figure out the model, we had to go to Copenhagen. And many of the people in the room know Copenhagen, right? It's uh, 
fairly large middleweight city, 600,000 people in the city, 2 million in the metropolis. It's a global leader in sustainable, sustainability. Every, every Danish person is born with an urge to bike, right? <laughs> and they do, um, particularly compared to the rest of the world. But 30 years ago, Copenhagen was Pittsburgh in the 1970s. 30 years ago, Copenhagen was flat on its back. Manufacturing had left the core city. The port had lost its reason for being because Malmo had become essentially the port of choice in that part of the world. Um, most of the growth, residential growth, in the Copenhagen metropolis was occurring outside the city, not inside the city. And the place was basically on the verge of fiscal bankruptcy. So what happened is that the city leaders, in collaboration with the national government, uh, got together and basically said, we need to do something that would be transformative for this metropolis. Um, and they looked at a couple different options, and they ultimately decided, we're going to build a 21st century metro system, subway system. The only challenge is we don't have any public resources to do this. So now we're going to have to start thinking. And we're going to have to figure out an institutional mechanism that ultimately raises the revenues necessary to service the debt on a modern transit system. So they came up, and this is something that has been done in Hong Kong, it's been done in Singapore, it's been done to a lesser degree in uh, Hamburg, in Hafen City, but they came up with this idea of a public asset corporation. And a public asset corporation is a publicly owned corporation that owns all the land and all the buildings, and to some extent, all the operating utilities in a particular part of your city, right? But the disposition of those assets, whether the sale of land or the leasing of land or the sale of buildings, is done professionally. There is no political interference. It is completely insulated from political interference. So what Copenhagen did is they merged a bunch of public authorities, and they ultimately created the Copenhagen City and Port Development Corporation. And you can go visit this company if you want to. It's right on the harbor of Copenhagen. It's only about 115 people who work there, but it has been the platform for a radical transformation of that city, in many respects now, the third wealthiest city in the world. Nordhaven is the North Harbor um, of Copenhagen. The Orestad district is the district between the airport and the downtown. So all the land in that, along the harbor front, particularly in the North Harbor, and in this Orestad district, which is given over to this public asset corporation. Again, it's publicly owned and professionally managed. And what the corporation was told by law is we want you to regenerate the core of Copenhagen. And we want you to do it in such a way where the revenues that are yielded from this go to build a transit system, okay? And that meant that they could make smart choices about every single individual parcel as opposed to being told by a politician here, there, or somewhere else, oh, by the way, I know someone who could buy that property and do this. No, no, none of that happened. This was basically a smart revitalization and regeneration of the core with the outcome being that Copenhagen now has one of the best transit systems in the world without a, without a kroner of public investment. Now, when they built up the subway system, um, what happens when you build up a subway system? There's lots of soil, right, that gets sort of dug up. They then took all that soil and moved it up to North Harbor and raised the land so that they would be protected from rising sea levels and climate change. A very Danish thing to do. But talk about the virtuous cycle 
of building a subway system and then getting the secondary and tertiary effects of that kind of activity. So now, instead of just biking around Copenhagen, which is a wonderful thing to do, um, for an American, you do tend to take your life in your hands because we don't bike as fast as the Danes do. Um, you can take a subway from anywhere to anywhere. It's an incredibly modern, efficient system. Uh, and we're now struggling to figure out how to adapt this. This is the head of the Copenhagen city and port, who is the former mayor of Copenhagen. We are not here for the quick fix. We're here for the long haul. Think about that. In the U.S., when we think about what the government owns, a parcel here, a parcel there, a parcel somewhere else, we sell it off fast. Get the quick buck. Cover this year's budget problem. In Copenhagen, they're building the third wealthiest place in the world. Um, several lessons, critical lessons, transparency. In the U.S., we know what the government owes. In Denmark, they knew what the government owns, and therein lies all the difference. If you know what the government owns, you can understand the value of it, and you could leverage it for public good. You have to think about assets, not just about deficits. They merge their public entities. We have lots of public authorities in the U.S. that were basically designed 100 years ago or 50 years ago. They're past their useful life. We're going to have to consolidate them to get the full effect. And they created a very interesting public-private management model. We talk about PPPs in terms of transactions. They built a public-private institution, and therein lies all the difference. How do you build a nation of problem solvers? And here's the challenge. For every Pittsburgh, we got dozens of cities subsidizing consumption. They're not investing in innovation, right? Build the next sports facility. That's not a long-term economic strategy, right? Build the next center of excellence at a world-class university, that's an innovation strategy. Every Indianapolis, there's hundreds of cities that do collaborate, but the collaboration is un informal, it's unstructured. There's no capital behind it. For every Copenhagen, there are thousands of cities that just leave value off the table. Right? We're not organizing ourselves as cities grow to extract value for long-term investment. So for any city in the world, the, really the question becomes, you know, what's your edge? Um, we're in an urban-led world, and cities have common, uniform challenges, but they have distinctive economies because of legacies, because of assets. So how do you leverage those up? How do you really understand that? In the U.S., we're creating a market tool called an investment prospectus. It would be automated, ultimately. I mean, big data analytics and geospatial mapping allow all of us to figure out these kinds of economic issues. Instead of creating the next app that gets us to the best restaurant in our city, why don't we create the next app that figures out what our economy is and how to build and leverage it? Who's in charge? Who's in charge? It's not just the government. It's networks of private, civic, university, community leaders. And if a city can activate its network, it ultimately can problem solve in much more effective, efficient, and democratic ways. And where is your power? And are your institutions up to the 21st century, or are they legacy institutions? They're operating circa 1950 or 1970 or 1990, right? And we're beginning to create an institutional audit in the U.S. where every public authority would have to be subjected to a whole set of questions to basically conclude, are you able to leverage the full assets of your city and metropolis? And can you particularly move from just private wealth creation, we're very good at that in the United States, to public wealth creation. That is the Copenhagen model. That's the gift that keeps on giving. So we think new localism is a philosophy and practice. It is also a different thesis about the kind of skills and competencies that leaders, whether they're public, private, civic, university, or community, will need to have to basically help their cities thrive and po prosper in the 21st century. So that is the new localism. Um, here's the book. You know, this is, 
uh, buy it. Unfortunately, it is not translated into Russian as far as I can tell. Uh, maybe that'll get done at some point. Um, at the end of the day, the city-state and the nation-states have to collaborate to compete and have to come together to work together for their citizens and their people. And that's the, the hope, that's the aspiration. And thank you very much for coming today.